Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our UC Ag Expert Talk today. My name is Cheryl Reynolds. I'm with the UC Statewide IPM program. Peter Cusina is also here with us. He's going to run the polls and troubleshoot any technical problems. Please note that this webinar is targeted to growers and agricultural pest management professionals. Master gardeners can certainly benefit from participating, but the pest management methods presented, especially the pesticides, are not to be followed without a clear understanding of their legal use in home environments. Okay, so now I'm gonna introduce our speaker today. We have doc Dr. Ben Faber. He's a UC Cooperative Extension Advisor for Ventura and Santa Barbara. Today, he is speaking on drought effects and Botrysferia fungi on permanent crops. And so Ben, I think you can go ahead and share your slides. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So we're gonna touch on something dear to my heart and uh, that's disease and destruction and irrigation. And uh, I wanna preface this with uh, most of the problems I see in agriculture as well as the, the reporting that we get from master gardeners are related to water. And um, it's not too much water, it's not too little water, it's not watering at the right time uh, with the right amount. And so this really sets up a, a, a plant for for stresses and, you know, stress leads to disease, dis-ease. Um, and we're gonna use avocado as a model. Now this is, avocado is a very sensitive to water and it really shows off problems if it's not watered right. But, you know, it's things like lemons and, you know, mangoes uh, are a lot tougher, but they are stressed, they just don't show it. They're much more masculine, I guess, or something like that. They don't show their feelings the way avocados do. So in the case of avocados, um, we have a disease that's worldwide called Phytophthora cinnamomy, or it's caused by Phytophthora cinnamomy. It's avocado root rot. And it's probably the most severe disease, most ser serious disease of avocado. Um, and it really thrives on excess moisture and poor drainage, but you know, water stressed in the sense of lack of water can actually bring it on too. And you see the thinning canopy and um, the, the, the problem with the uh, avocado root rot is it looks like a water stressed plant. So the common response is, oh, let's put more water on it. And actually it, it just leads to a more rapid decline of the tree. We do have some pretty decent methods of controlling it. Um, basically it goes back to managing the irrigation. We have rootstocks that are resistant and tolerant. We know that gypsum helps, mounding helps, and the phosphonates. These are a wondrous uh, material that uh, are called various things, phosphites, phosphorus acid. They come under about 30 different brand names, all of which act about the same. And we use mulch. Now, this is a key word, mulch. Mulch is a material that breaks down through decomposition by fungi primarily. And uh, it creates an atmosphere that's hostile to, to uh, Phytophthora cinnamomy. But it also creates another situation. And if you stay with me, you'll see what that problem is. So we use phosphorus acid, pho phosphorus phosphorus acid, it's not phosphoric acid. And it can really rejuvenate a, a root system of not just avocados, but of all tree crops. Um, and it works on you know, potatoes and tomatoes as well. It's a, just an amazing material. It only works on Phytophthoras and Pythiums. It doesn't work on other fungi. And uh, a lot of people will start using phosphorus acid kind of indiscriminately for any problem that they see. And it just does not work unless you've got <clears throat> phytophthora in the case of avocado. So phosphorus acid is registered in California as a fertilizer. Um, it's not a very good fertilizer, but it's a, a tr f fabulous material when it comes to um, kind of stimulating 
uh, the plant's re response to the disease to fight it off. Um, it's not a true fungicide, it's a fungistat. It, it works by turning on a plant's defense mechanism. Um, and there's quite a few brands on the market and most of them work about the same. Um, you know, they try and distinguish each other. There, there are foliar applied, there are soil applied. One is buffered, the other is a true acid. Um, I try not to play with it because it's a true acid. I mean, it's, it'll burn the heck out of you. So the foliars which are buffered are probably the best to use. And then we use mulch and um, mulch is very effective. It works through uh, by decomposing, um, which creates an environment that is hostile to uh, Phytophthora, but it also is hostile to a lot of other things. But one of the primary decomposers is this group of fungi called Botryospherias. And these are saprophytes, they feed off of dead tissue. And they will go to live tissue if you have a stress tree. But the, you know, mulching is a very effective practice. It's a naturally, natural process natural process that uh, creates an environment that is hostile to Phytophthora. And it, it's uh, one of the common fungi found in the, in the soil where decomposition of organic matter is occurring are the Botryospheres. And here they are. This is not a Botryospheria, but this is a, another fungal species that is feeding off of, saprophytically, it's feeding off of the dead tissue, creating enzymes, Fungi don't have mouths, they have enzymes that break down material and they absorb that material. And this is how fungi live. Um, and it, the, the enzymes that are decomposing the, the woody material are the ones that break down the phytophthora. Okay, we have other phytophthoras and these are water related. These are phytophthoras. In this case, this is an avocado again, but there are many other Phytophthoras that cause trunk cankers, and this is where water actually hits the trunk. And um, you know, ha having a mulch up against uh, the tree trunk in, in this case actually creates a wet environment, which would lead to phytophthora. So in this case, having mulch against the trunk is not a good idea. Um, turns out, Phytophthora mengii, which used to be called Phytophthora citricola, uh, is a um, uh, treatable with the phosphonates as well, with phosphorus acid materials. Um, it is quite effective, but you have to get the phosphorus acid or the buffered material right on, the, on these cankers for it to work. And this is one reason why we, we get these trunk cankers. It's because water is getting on the trunks and creating this environment. The phytophthoras love water, they love to float in water, they love to swim in water. And if you create a wet environment up against the trunk as you would create if you had mulch up against the trunk, in this case, you're gonna create that environment. And when you have poor irrigation, you're gonna create a situation where you have a wet trunk and phytophthora is gonna move right up into that trunk. And it can actually keep moving on into the fruit. And so this is Phytophthora citricola, Phytophthora mengii that's on fruit. And um, uh, it, it is uh, responsive to the phosphonates as well. So the, the, uh, Phytophthoras are water related. They are water stress related they, in the sense that too much water but also it can happen if you lack water. Any stress tree is gonna be more prone to, to phytophthoras. Now I'm moving into Dothiorella. Dothiorella is one of the Botryospherias and it can cause a fruit rot as well. And uh, causes a kind of shrunken fruit. It causes, uh, uh, usually it'll be fruit lower down in the canopy uh, where, where you get rain splash off the, the, um, the mulch. Okay, remember Botryospherias are decomposers of organic material, but they will go to 
for example, a, a sunburn piece of fruit, which the sunburn is actually a, a, a dead spot. So Botrysferids are decomposers. They're saprophytes looking for uh, organic dead material to, to decompose. So I'm leading up to something here. Drought, stress, or salt damage can lead to toxicities in the tree, can lead to deficiencies, it can lead to disease, it can lead to death, it can lead to more pests, it can lead to heat stress, lack of water, means the tree can't transpire and can't cool itself. So you end up having dead tissue and it can reduce tree growth. And so these are all problems that are, it's often difficult to distinguish which among them is most prominent, but usually it turns out it's just poor irrigation, poor salt management. And so what are these common salt pro water problems? Well, you see wilting, you know, curling of the leaves. Oop, uh, and I just had some, somebody send me a whole bunch of pictures of curled leaves asking, what disease is this? And I, you know, what do you say? Well, the disease is lack of attention to water. Put your finger in the ground and see if it's wet or dry. Um, here's the case of, of too much water, asphyxiation. Um, this happened in uh, about five years ago when we had about 50 inches of rain out in Fillmore. And it can lead to root rot. Okay, so th there's very common problems. Um, some of the more obvious problems of lack of water are tip burn, as you see here, um, dieback, and then when there's inadequate water, you'll start seeing uh, fruit damage. Um, and this is sunburn that results from uh, basically a, a lack of canopy to protect the fruit from, from sunburn. And then eventually you'll see uh, leaf drop and, and shriveled fruit. And so this shriveled fruit often is Dothyarella affected fruit. So the, the fruit, the leaves start shriveling. Um, you start getting dieback occurring and the Dothyarella moves into the canopy, starts feeding on the dead tissue of the leaves and the dead tissue of the fruit. So here's an example of, of a clear uh, lack of water or salt damage leading to a, um, a disease, uh, what we call Dothyarella or um, leaf blight or fruit blight. And these are, this is, these are problems that no phosphonate is going to affect. These are not caused by Phytophthora. They're caused by um, uh, a fungus, the Botrysferias. Okay, here we go. Thank you. Um, so some of these problems, we may not see wilting. Some of this, these problems are in the fruit. Um, I, you don't see this so much. Well, you do see it in avocado. You'll see black spots sometimes showing up in water stressed uh, trees. But uh, in the case of citrus, this is, uh, we've, we've had drought in the past and these are little satsumas. And they show what's called endoxerosis. It's kind of drying up in the center. Uh, you'll see some rind staining showing up. And these all show up in, in water stressed trees. Um, and uh, so you don't always see it in the canopy. Lack of water leads to, you know, in, in, on the left side, uh, the, this is, we have real problems with um, boron toxicity here along the coast. And if you don't manage water in citrus very well, you'll see boron um, toxicity or chloride damage. Uh, it turns out avocados are pretty darn resistant to boron toxicity. You can put a lot of boron on and they, they don't show it. Um, but citrus and a lot of most other tree crops do show it. What avocados do show is a significant sensitivity to sodium and total salts. And you'll see this typical uh, uh, tip burn. Dead tissue means it is open season for saprophytes like Botrysferia. So when you start seeing something like this, when you start seeing tip burn, you're gonna start leading to other um, potential fungal issues. Uh, lack of water can lead to um, 
um, especially nitrogen deficiency. You, you see general yellowing, potassium deficiency. Okay, no amount of fertilizer applied is going to change this um, because it takes water to move these materials into the plant. So when, when you start seeing color changes in the leaf, that means that there's a, a problem with the water. And that is, always presages uh, potential uh, leaf blight botrysferia issues later on. Okay, avocados again, but uh, I'm showing these just because there's, avocados are so sensitive and so uh, capable of showing their response. This is black streak. This is a botrysferia. You see the black streak forming here. Uh, you see it's actually a canker that forms. Uh, uh, bacterial canker. This is a response that occurs to water stress. It's really a disgusting looking disease. It's non-pathogenic. You can take this and transfer it to a healthy tree, a well-watered tree, and it will not show the symptoms. It's non-pathogenic. You cannot transfer it. And then we have the, the, the thiorella cankers that show up. These are all cankers that are showing up in water stress trees, and they're coming from botrysferias, and generally they are feeding off the dead tissue that's in an orchard. There's no clean, there's no orchard that's so clean that you're not going to find botrysferias. You know, a lemon orchard that is treated with pre-emergence and glyphosate and it's weed free, you're still going to find dead tissue out there and you're going to find botrysferia feeding on that. And so the spores that cause this are looking for stress trees that have some dead tissue on which they can feed. This is avocado black streak, and it's really uh, pretty impressive. You'll see these cankers moving up and down the, the, the branches or even the cankers. It's only found in California. The white exudate is actually a, the sugar. It's the, the sap coming out if you put your tongue to it, as your mother told you not to. It, you'll, it tastes sweet. It's a, it's, a, it's a sweet sugar exudate from the avocado. And it's related to water stress. You relieve the water stress, and those cankers dry up and go away. And it's caused by a botrysferia. Avocado canker, this is another one, uh, water stress. It's a disgusting looking disease. These cankers show up. If you take your pen, pocket knife, and poke it in one of those uh, cankers, it'll uh, release a fluid, which is pent up sap, which is the, 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 the sweet sugar exudate. Um, and again, when you re relieve the water stress, and the water stress can be just timing, okay, getting the right timing. You know, uh, there, there used to be these growers out here that would water once a month for 48 hours, you know, just a heck of a water stress, and then come back a month later. And, and in between that and the next, in the last irrigation, it, the trees went under a lot of stress. And, you know, the avocados didn't grow very well, they, they grew valentias. Dothiorella stem and leaf blight. This is, a, Dothiorella is a Botrysferia. This is a, what, what um, is called salt and pepper syndrome. You'll see a little bit of dead tissue, uh, dieback that occurs on, on the canopy and it's surrounded by nice healthy tissue. It usually happens when um, you've got a new flush and we get a San Ana condition and it dries out that new flush, dies and the, you know, Botrysferia jumps on that dead tissue. Um, it's, it's not a big deal with mature trees, but on young, young trees, young lemons, you know, one year old, on, on uh, you know, small plants, uh, this Botrysferia can just keep growing down that tissue. Most of the tree is dead, right? The only living parts are the green parts, you know, the, the green leaves, the green stems, the interior of all these plants is lignin, which is dead tissue. And that's exactly what the botrysferias are looking for. They're looking for dead tissue to feed off of. 
and they will feed off of the young tissue all the way down to the, the, the rootstock and you lose your tree. Dothyorella, it's a, it's a fungus, it's a Botrysferia, it's the same thing that causes the fruit rot. Dothyorella gregaria, um, where does the, the fungus come from and the spores come from? It comes from the dead tissue that's on the ground. It's just waiting, looking for, lurking for a water stress tree. Um, and oftentimes these are, it's not a, you know, a primary pathogen, it's one of these secondary pathogens that, you know, once you relieve the stress, a lot of times the, the symptoms go away. More water stress, the Botrysferia, they cause stem blights, leaf blights, um, Botrysferia uh, gamosis, I've seen this on citrus. Um, you know, it's, it, it's a, a, a fungal infection that is not going to be corrected by any of the phosphonates. People start spraying their trees with phosphonates thinking that it's going to clear it up. It is not going to treat it. It only works, phosphonates only work against Phytophthoras. Um, these Botrysferias uh, will move from the dead tissue on the leaves, okay? And if it's near to the fruit, it will move to the fruit. Um, and once it's on the fruit, uh, the fruit's a goner. There's no point in keeping it. In fact, it usually drops off. So here, the question is, you know, we're mulching. We're mulching in order to correct uh, a situation where Phytophthora is rampant. Mulch has been shown clearly to, to uh, create an atmosphere that's hostile to Phytophthora. It's a very important tool in our uh, control of Phytophthora and avocado. And, and for that matter, it, it works in other trees, but it's, it's not so pronounced. Um, so these are Botrysferia, and we're actually creating an environment that is ripe. It's loaded with inoculum. And if we allow these trees to go under water stress, um, it's going to cause problems because the inoculum's there. Okay, so water stress trees are also prone to more pests. So red mite, brisea mite, mites really do like water stress trees. Um, the, uh, a lot of insects are looking for um, stress. Um, in the case of Asian citrusilla though, it's, it's, it, uh, uh, if you create a water stress, you have less lush growth or no growth and psyllids are looking for that. So actually, if you're trying to control Asian citrus psyllid, if that's your only goal in life, um, actually water stressing a, a lemon tree might be a good idea because then the psyllids won't find it. Polyphagous shot hole borer. Um, we had a real scare, um, although this uh, insect does go to avocados, it goes to primarily water stressed avocados and neglected avocados. Um, uh, avocados that have been hit by frost. It does go to a lot of other trees though. Um, hickory, walnut, peaches, and then a whole host of, of native and landscape plants. Um, most borers are looking for water stressed plants. And um, in the case of the polyphag, a shot hole borer, this is a, a character that is carrying a fusarium fungus that it feeds on, which is introduced into the tree. And then the uh, fungus starts feeding off of the tissue, the dead tissue in the tree. It's feeding off, like the Botrysferia, but it's not a Botrysferia. It's feeding off the dead tissue inside the tree, the, the lignin in the tree, and then the beetle feeds off that fusarium. And so gradually the fusarium kills the tree, the canopy dies. Um, it's kind of a slow death. In the last two to three years though, I've seen 
a lot of trees that were affected by um, the sh shot hole bore along the Ventura River and along the Santa Clara River, looking at the sycamores that had been hit. Sycamores are, are just you know candy to these insects. Uh, I've seen a lot of the trees recover and the, and the cankers go away. So um, down in the Tijuana River in San Diego, the willows were annihilated. I mean, you could not find a willow and they're coming back. And I, I don't know what's going on Maybe they're going to come back and then they're going to be big enough for the boar to go after again. But, um, you know, everything is in cycle. We, we had a uh, avocado fruit weevil here last year that was hitting trees all over the place. And this year I, I was asking around, nobody's seen it. So there's a cycle to everything. Anyway, um, uh, shot hole borer is looking for a water stress tree and um, if you keep the trees happy and healthy the borer is not going to have much impact on them in the case of avocados. Water and salt stress lead to smaller trees, smaller yields, smaller fruit. Um, salt acts as if uh, you lack water. You know, water is attracted to salt which means salt is uh, going to differentially pull water away from a tree, causing water stress in, in the tree. So what do you do about uh, water and salt stress? Well, you fix the irrigation system. Um, most of our irrigation systems are drip or micro sprinkler and they're tinker toys and they're easily damaged. Coyotes go in and rip them up. Uh, pickers go in unintentionally knocking things over. Uh, it's amazing how poor most of our irrigation systems are. They're, they work well when they're brand new and they've been well designed, um, but pretty rapidly they get clogged uh, and over time different emitters get put in that are, are not consistent with the design of the system. And you start getting different outputs at different trees and some trees get too much water and some get too lot, little water. And that's when you start getting the stresses that make the trees prone to Botryospherias. Again, Botryospherias are a, a, a mild, fungal saprophyte. It's just looking for the water stress trees. You need to apply water uniformly. Um, that means making sure that this emitter puts out exactly what that emitter puts out at, at given during a given irrigation time. The irrigation schedules need to be adjusted. Irrigating along the coast is the hardest thing. I mean, if I grew up in Fresno. If no, I did grow up in Fresno. And it was like, you know, on July 1st, it was 105 and it was 105 for the next, you know, three months. And you knew exactly, you know, you could set, you know, your irrigation to, to come on every Wednesday or every Thursday or every two weeks or whatever it was. And, and you knew exactly how much to put out. Along the coast here, right now, it's overcast. On Sunday, it got to 80 degrees. It was nice and clear. This is a crazy environment to irrigate in. And if you don't adjust your irrigation schedule, if you, if you don't adjust to the needs of the tree, you're gonna lead to problems. And it's very common to see leaf blight, dithyorella blight in orchards, in coastal um, orchards. Um, and the, the hardest thing is to get a grower to go out and put their shovel in, put their soil tube in, get their finger into the ground and see whether it's wet or dry. Um, and that is what determines the irrigation schedule, frequent um, attention to the irrigation system. And then we all, all the waters that we have here, I just heard a uh, presentation about irrigation in Israel and they're using reverse osmosis water in their agriculture now. I mean, that's pure water where they have to add salt to the water in order to get infiltration. Well, we don't have that problem. We got too much salt in our water. And there has to be some 
compensation for that accumulation of salt that we put on at each irrigation. And so, you know, you can, you know, devise some sort of irrigation fraction, leaching fraction, um, adding 10% more, or <clears throat> occasionally adding uh, extra hours uh, uh, with every third or fourth or fifth irrigation in order to, to leach. Um, every orchard's going to be different because every orchard has different soils. It's got different uh, aspects and, and um, north facing and south facing and and all the wells have got different um, salinity. So there is, and, and then we're really dependent on, on rainfall. If we have adequate rainfall late into the season, if we have rain into April and we put on less uh, irrigation water, we're gonna have fewer problems with salt. Um, when we have no rainfall or we only have December, January rainfall, then we have to worry about a leaching fraction. So um, uh, th that has to be included in, in the irrigation schedule, a, a, a leaching amount. So when we have inadequate water, some people try and, and spread it out. Um, and that's not the way to do it because you're only going to cause destruction across the whole orchard. Really what you need to do is think of of uh, breaking the orchard into um, blocks and irrigating according to the needs of the block. And if there's in inadequate water for doing the whole orchard, um, actually go through and um, uh, head back the orchard or that part of the orchard, you know, stump it back. Um, and we saw this six years ago uh, quite extensively, whitewash and Pray for rain, um, but don't try and spread water out because you're only going to set up the, the trees for, for disease and stress. Okay, so what's the take-home lesson? You can't buy anything to correct a salt problem. There's a lot of stuff out there, magnetic water, you know, electronic water, you know, there's nothing you can do to, you know, you can't extend water um, other than doing good water management, making the irrigation system work right. Um, you, you cannot buy a pesticide, you cannot buy a fungicide that's gonna solve the problem. It's either irrigate right or uh, plant to the, the amount of trees, the amount of water that you have for the trees. We have a newsletter um, Topics and Subtropics, it uh, comes out quarterly. It's available at this uh, link here. Um, and then we've got a, a blog that comes out three times, three times a week usually. And it's usually uh, topical, you know, what's going on, what I see. Went out and saw a whole bunch of hail damage the other day. I'm going, whoa, whoa. And it was pointed out to me, and I, when I saw it, I thought, oh, man, this is stink bug damage. And, and I was told by the PCA, oh, no, that's, uh, that happened with the, the hail that occurred three weeks prior. So, um, you know, just a symptom is only a symptom. It doesn't tell you what caused the, the symptom. So you need a lot of information. So with that, it's 4 o'clock, and if there's any questions, we can answer them. Okay, so I will go in the order I think that they came in. So the first one is, how can you tell the difference between Phytophthora and Sunscald on avocado? It looks the same. Phytophthora and Sunscald. Sunscald on the fruit or on, or on the trunks. Sunscald is typically a, a dieback caused by uh, sunburn and uh, you know, phytophthora is damage to the roots, which means damage to the canopy, which means opening up the canopy to sun burn or sun scald. So sun scald is a, is a symptom of, of probably a root problem, which, you know, they may be linked or, or they may be completely separate because if you go through and you prune a tree and you open it up to, to sunlight, you're gonna get sun burn. I'm presuming sun scald and sunburn are synonymous. 
Um, so anytime sun is on tissue that has been in the shade, uh, it, it can sunburn quite easily. And so, you know, if, if you have a sudden problem like a Santa Ana blow through and knock the leaves off or you have freeze, you got to get it in there and whitewash to prevent sunburn damage. Okay, and we just got a clarification on the last question I asked you about the difference between Phytophthora and Sun Scald. Um, she was clarifying it to mean but Botrysferia. Okay, Botrysferia is, it looks, it's a leaf blight, it's a dieback. Um, it's, uh, Phytophthora root rot, the, you see a thinning canopy, thinning leaves, smaller leaves, uh, yellow leaves. You see dieback, you see what's called staghorning. If you go down and you start digging around, you cannot find any roots. And if you do find any roots, they're black. In the case of Botrysferia, the root system is, can be perfectly healthy. And it's, and it's starting on the dying tissue that you find. So you, you start there and, and um, uh, but the key, the key is get on your knees and look at the roots. If you find roots, you don't have root rot. You've got um, Botrysferia. And, and, you know, kind of review what your irrigation pro program has been, or has there been a Santa Ana condition? In the in this Las Posas Valley, boom, suddenly off that Santa Ana that we had about two, three weeks ago. I mean, every orchard showed it. And, it, and if it suddenly shows up like that, you know it's not root rot. It's, you know, when it's area wide, you know it's something else. Okay, uh, the next one here. Are slower decaying mulches like bark mulch uh, less problematic than wood mulch or leaf mulches? The best mulches are the ones that are persistent and are there long enough so that the root architecture that develops in response to that mulch doesn't disappear suddenly. And so a grassy mulch, you put it out, you know, even if you put a foot of it out, it's gone within four to six months. And so if you get roots adapting to that mulch and suddenly it's not there, boom, they're exposed and they're, they go into stress. So a woody mulch is the best mulch for just about any situation. Okay, there's a few more questions here about the mulch. Um, so I'll combine a few of these. What is the recommendation for mulching around the tree um, is it three feet away from the trunk? And then what is the thickness of that mulch? Yeah, you don't, you don't want, the, the, one of the keys to mulch is that it's water conservation, but it's also weed suppression. So you wanna be uh, there so that you can get that weed suppression effect. So it's six to eight inches from the trunk. Um, and then it's, you know, you know, commercially you can't go much, deeper than about six inches. I never would I go a foot deep because then you start tripping over this stuff. But you know, somewhere in between three and six inches is probably the, the, the best thing to do. And what you're trying to do is kickstart the system so that um, you have the mulch there and then the tree starts creating its own mulch with, you know, in a two year period. So you want a woody material that is persistent, that is there for two years or so in which is the length of time that it takes for, you know, the tree to, you know, a lemon tree, a, 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 you know, macadamia tree, whatever, to start creating its own mulch. And, and so that's the best mulch for the tree. Okay. Um, how do you apply enough water for leaching salts, but not too much to cause Phytophthora? Ah, boy, that's a secret. I can't tell you. Anyway, um, the, the, the key is figuring out the irrigation cycle that when you apply five hours, eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, you put on a depth of water that goes to 18 inches, okay? So you figure out, okay, every time I irrigate, I'm gonna irrigate and I'm gonna get 18 inches worth of infiltration. And then, th the key is figuring out when do I come back? And that, that is, um, you know, you can kind of get a sense of that um, with the weather, but you know, mainly you're looking at day length and wind 
and humidity, not so much temperature. Anyway, you dig through the mulch and you grab a handful of soil and if, and if the soil holds together and you can see the, the palm, the, the, the pattern of the palm of your hand, you have adequate moisture. When you squeeze that, and this is true for sandy soil or clay soil, if you squeeze it and you release the pressure and you see cracking happen, it's time to irrigate. So that sets up the schedule. The amount that you put on, it's gonna be 12 hours in, in order to get 18 inches worth of infiltration. And the timing, the spacing in between the irrigation is gonna be controlled by how, when you take a handful of soil down to about four inches and you squeeze it and it holds together or it does not hold together. So that'll give you the sense of, do I need to go one week or three days or 12 days or two weeks or three weeks? You know, there, when we start getting May, gray, June gloom, you can go quite a bit longer in between irrigations. And so the Phytophthora is looking for a tree that lacks oxygen. Every time you irrigate, you remove air from, from the soil. And that is what Phytophthora likes. So you're trying to irrigate as little as you need to um, in order to prevent Phytophthora from getting established. So, you know, it, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a real art. And you, know, you can use tensiometers, you know, you can use soil moisture meters. I mean, there's a lot of equipment out there that, that can help you identify the soil moisture content. And so learn how to use those as well. Oh, and those El Cheapo, you know, $10 soil moisture measurements, you know, it's a little rod, you know, they're cheap, you know, if you drop them, they break and you go out and you buy another one for $10, but they work. And so that, they, they, if you don't hit a rock, they work, but uh, they, uh, they, they can help you learn when to irrigate. So I think this question um, is probably relating to that uh, what came in during that part of the, the message. Which device is the better one and where can we find these devices? Oh, gosh, there's some, I mean, I really love tensiometers. And the, the thing about tensiometers is they're smarter than we are because if you lose water tension in there, that means you weren't out there looking at them enough. And so if you're monitoring a, a, a tensiometer and it's in the right spot, boy, it, it tells you exactly the stress that the tree is seeing. But there's a lot of other things like, and, and you can usually find them, you know, um, Eurometer and uh, uh, what's the company up in Santa Barbara makes them, you know, you can get a, you know, a good 18 inch one for $75. And, you know, if they're, protected, they, they work really well. Um, you can get decagons for about $300. You know, they, they um, you can hook those to your computer and, um, you know, they're all online. Um, uh, and again, you know, those El Chifo little water wands do work. Um, and a lot of times the, 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 these devices teach you what to look for and after about a year of using them, a lot of times you, you can go, oh, I know how to do it now. So they're, they're teaching tools more than anything, I think. Okay, um, any suggestions for what is the best mulch to use for avocados on sandy loam or clay loam soils? Woody persistent mulch is what you use for all tree crops. You know, it's, I, it doesn't matter what the soil is, it's, you want something that is there long enough that the root system adapts to what is there. If you put something down that is there for a short period of time, disappears, and the roots have started learning to use that, and then it's gone, that's bad news for the roots. So a woody, persistent material, not too coarse. You don't want to have it, you know, planks of it, but, you know, one to two to three inches in diameter, so, so you don't trip over it. Okay, here's one that says, um, and I'm not sure if I'm gonna pronounce this right. I saw a Netafim schedule that recommends watering with drip daily with less water in Israel for consistent moisture. 
do California farmers follow these recommend recommendations and do you agree? Yeah, Netafim um, is a reliable company. They make uh, irrigation equipment. Um, this uh, frequent irrigation I've seen as much as five times a day. Every time you irrigate, every time you apply water, water is excluding air. So you create a kind of tense environment. So the, this technique of frequent small irrigation came out of Israel, I think. Um, and, you know, it was designed to kind of keep salts in dilution. Uh, I, I don't think we have the, the level of salts. I, I mean, I, I saw them irrigating with with some pretty, pretty saline water there along the coast. Uh, and I don't know if we have a need to do anything like that. I, we need to manage water so that uh, we do include a leaching fraction. We do keep salts diluted. Um, but, you know, if you're doing daily irrigation, if you get a Santa Ana blowing through, you're behind. No, <laughs> you, you can't get enough water on. You're, you're screwed. So, uh, no, I don't agree with that. I, I think we need to irrigate as infrequently as possible with a volume that wets the soil to a depth that the, is in the root zone and that the, the trees can um, can access. Now, if you're a young tree, if not, if you have young trees, you know, you may ir be irrigating, you know, small, small, two or three or times a week or, you know, Santa Ana comes in, you know, you're putting on five gallons at each time. But, uh, you know, for mature trees, I don't see any need to do daily irrigation. You know, it's, again, if we get a Santa Ana, you're going to be behind. It's, you know, it's going to suck every single, and I've seen trees within two days show Botrys area, you know, because of lack of water after Santa Ana, so. Okay, the next one is, um, so removing all dead tissue constantly from the tree is the best practice. Um, even small dieback branches that are going to fall off eventually anyway? No, you can carry this to, uh, you know, you can be too Martha Stewart-ish. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, if, if you have a canopy that's too big and you got shading in the interior, you're going to get dieback and you're going to get botrys. But the tree does compartmentalize. So it, it shuts off the... Um, that dead tissue. So if you relieve the stress, the water stress, it, it's not going to be a problem on a mature tree. So no, going out and clip, 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 you know, every month, every month or so, no, that's not going to do it. You know, you include it in your pruning program. So, you know, it, in, unless it's some major event that's come through like a freeze, like a heat spell, like we have 118 degrees, you know, you leave that until the tissue pushes out, the new tissue pushes out and protects the tree, and then you go through and, and clear it out. But, but you only do that with major events, not on a, you know, a s small salt and pepper uh, problem now and then. Okay, uh, what is a better way to apply water to the base of a tree? One big bubbler or a bunch of little bubblers spaced around the tree's root system? <laughs> oh, you know, the, the drip irrigation works. It really does. It's, it, and uh, a dripper will more consistently put out a uniform amount than a micro sprinkler. Problem is that they clog. And, and then once they clog, then you have problems. Some of these inline um, uh, Drip systems like uh, uh, oh, I'm blanking right now. Netafin's got them, um, but all the big companies have got them now. They they they've got larger aperture. They tend not to to clog so well. They still need fil filtration. Um, and and if you put out drippers on either side, you know this is for avocados. Um, because uh, avocados are shallow rooted, they need a larger wetted area. With 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 um, citrus and most other trees, you don't 
you know, they've got a deeper rooted system, so you don't need to uh, irrigate such a large area because once water hits the soil surface, it onions, you know, it balloons out lower down, and so it wets a larger area and volume lower down. So um, I, I would go with more drippers because a dripper applies water at the rate that intake occurs. A bubbler floods a system excluding all air. So a dripper system is kind of a nice compromise of getting water there and keeping good aeration. Uh, having said that, bubblers don't clog. You don't need a filtration system. Um, but you know, you know, it's uh, it's it's on a riser. It's probably going to get kicked and broken. Um, so I don't know. You know, all, all these systems boil down to maintenance and and how you treat them. So, you know, if you like bubblers, you know, and you know how to use them, go ahead and use it. But uh, the modern drip system is works pretty well as long as it has good filtration. Okay, how do you determine the right place to install a tensiometer? The right sighting of a tensiometer, a tension meter, is uh, with a representative tree, not a disease tree, not a tree that too small or too big, but a representative tree in the orchard in the wetted zone near within the canopy. Okay, so if you have an orchard where the emitters, you have micro sprinklers and they're spread halfway between each tree so you don't wet the trunk and have cankers showing up, you space the, the tensiometer in row uh, under the tree, you know, uh, canopy in line with the, the emitters. So if, if you've got drip emitters, you're going to put it slightly to the side of the of the drip line in between the the, the tree trunk and the and the emitter it, but it, it's it's got to be in the wetted zone you know i once had a grower call me out and said my, my tensiometer just doesn't work it doesn't change and he had it in the middle of the alley and and you know where it wasn't wet, where there weren't any roots, and I said, "Why is it there?" And he said, "Oh, it's easy to read." Well, <laughs> that's that maybe easy to read, but it doesn't work. So. Okay, another one. Um, does black streak differ substantially from other stem bots? Um, is it a different species within the genus? You know, this is interesting. Um, oh, I'm sure the Botrysphere is. And, and when I say Botrysphere, I'm I'm talking about similar fungi. There's, um, golly, I can't remember. There, there's at least three different large genera that are similar to Botrysphere's. Um, there's about 15 that uh, Akif DNA'd, and uh, he was working on black streak, and it's different. And when he retired, retired, I don't mean he retired, he, when he left UCR to to go work on grapes, those nasty vines up there at UC Davis and left it was alone with you know, plant pathologist. Um, uh, he hadn't uh, identified the, the, the species of, of black streak. But the, see, that was the interesting thing. For years and years and years, it was said, oh, this is a viroid. Well, why is it a viroid? Well, we don't know what viroids are, so let's, let's call it a viroid. <laughs> it's sort of like, let's put it in this box here because we don't know what's in that box. And you know, he, he did some really good work. But at, at, at this point, I, I don't know if we know what the species is. Okay, um, if trees are located in very rainy locations, would that affect the level of salts? You know, uh, thank gosh for rain, but then, you know, thank gosh that we don't have rain because almost all the diseases that we have are soil-borne diseases. And I'm not just talking about avocados, I'm talking about all agriculture in, in California. You know. If you go to a rain-fed environment like New Zealand, they're dealing with these fruit diseases and leaf diseases, and they're spraying copper and doing all these things. They don't have any salt problems. <laughs> but man, they got a lot of other problems, and they're spraying 
all kinds of fungicides. Oh, I don't know what I prefer, you know, the California Mediterranean environment with salts. Um, and, you know, this is an issue wherever Mediterranean agriculture is. In, in Chile, in New Zealand, excuse me, in, in Australia, in Spain, in Turkey, in Egypt, in Israel. They're, we're fighting salts all the time, but we don't have most of these fruit diseases that um, require fungicides that they have, they have to do in New Zealand and South African places. Okay, a uh, couple questions about watering with roots. Um, aren't roots good at finding water? And then does deeper watering lead to the deeper rooting? Roots do not seek out water. Boom. They do not seek out water. Roots do not seek out water. Roots grow where there is water. And so if there's no water and there's water, you know, unless you're getting some kind of water movement that, that this, the, the roots can sense, you know, you're getting some kind of, uh, you know. Anyway, as, so if, if there's water three feet and, and, and there's away from root, the root is not gonna find it. It's, it does not seek out water, it grows where there is water. It grows where there are nutrients. It grows where there is air. So um, it, it, I don't know how to answer that question any better than that. So you're not gonna, if, if you water shallowly, you know, this is a real problem. You know, if you try and grow an avocado in a lawn and you got a, the irrigation on the lawn coming on five minutes every day and, and you're only wetting the top, you know, two inches, you're going to accumulation of salts, and that's where the roots are, and the, the avocado is going to die. You need to do deep irrigation in order to get the resource deeper down so that the roots can be deeper down. But if, uh, and that's the only way roots are going to grow deeper, if, if there is water, and it's got to be water from the surface down, or unless you've got some kind of buried drip where you get some kind of movement of water up, you know, through kind of capillary rise, uh, and then you'll find roots deeper down. But, uh, you know, shallow irrigations are going to cause a shallow irrigation, excuse me, shallow root system. And um, if, if they're water three feet down, the roots are not going to find it. Okay, there's another one. Um, at what, and I hopefully I'm pronouncing it right this time, uh, tensometer <laughs> cinnabar reading is best for triggering irrigation without stressing the trees too much. Tensiometer, tension meter, tensiometer. A tensiometer is typically used at a, about 25 cinnabar, and um, that's kind of year in, year out. If you know that you're kind of going to a mild weather situation, you know, it's May, gray, June, gloom, you can let it go to 40 or so because you know you you know that the tree is not going to go under <clears throat> immediate stress. If you're in Santa Ana conditions, which basically I don't know if you it's Santa Ana's can happen any month of the year now, but it used to be traditional October through March. And if you kept your eyes open, um, you know usually they can forecast a Santa Ana seven to ten days out, um, and, and then you really have to stick to the 25 centibar. Um, you know, the, uh, so if you know it's stable, you can go uh, a, a little more dry. Um, if, but if you know that uh, you're, you're going to be in these weird situations like we've been in the last week where it was warm this weekend and it's cool now, I wouldn't go beyond 25 centibar. So it depends. But, you know, if you want to be really conservative and really stick to it, 25 centibar. Okay, um, there is a clarification that somebody wants. Um, I thought you said mulch feeds on, but I don't know. It says Botryas, and I'm assuming it means Botryas feria and Phytophthora. Mulch is decomposed by Botryas feria. It's a saprophyte. And um, uh, when it breaks down the organic material, it does it with enzymes. And those enzymes 
when they're breaking down the woody material, they actually break down the phytophthora cell wall. So that's how Botrysferes compete with, with, with phytophthora. And that's why they can be so effective at um, controlling root rot. Okay, just a few more here. Um, uh, when only parts of an avocado tree are dying after a bout of dry hot wa weather like Santa Ana, is that because part of the root system is dried out and do certain branches get their water from certain roots? Yeah, that's a really good question. And the, 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 the way the, in a mature tree, in, in a young tree, you know, it's sort of like, uh, you know, I scavenge and, and, and it goes to everyone. It's, whereas in a mature tree, it, 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 you, you can break it into quadrants. For nutrients, so I've seen this where um, part of a tree uh, is in a calcareous or uh, in, a, in a position where there's lacking iron and you'll see just one quadrant of the tree show iron chlorosis and the rest of the tree looks fine. Okay, that works for nutrients. In the case of water, it, once water gets into a tree, it goes throughout the tree. It, it moves throughout the tree. Um, so it, 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 there isn't kind of like a partitioning with, within the tree. Uh, if you see dieback occurring on one side of the tree, that's you know that you know makes me think. Oh, somebody dropped some too much fertilizer on that corner or something like that, it wouldn't be water. Uh, when you see water, uh, when you see dieback in a tree due to water, it's usually the whole tree, or it might be the kind of like the west facing uh, where you, know, you get the hottest sun. And so the, the, the transpirational demand is greatest there and it, and it can't be delivered fast enough. And that's where you, you see the death. Um, you may not see it on the east side because there's no, you know, the transpirational demand happened earlier in the day. And so there was adequate water and there is adequate water and it couldn't move water fast enough from that side of the tree to the side that needs the water fast enough. So, uh, so once water is in a tree, it kind of distributes throughout the tree. Okay, and this one, um, I have an overgrown avocado. Um, I'd like to rehab the tree, pruning suggestions, and what's the minimum diameter of branch cut that they can get away with and get new bud break for reestablishing the branches or the maximum diameter branch cut? You can cut an avocado. You saw those, that picture of towards the end of trees that were stumped, you know, there are, what are called latent buds from the day that baby tree was born and they will push through the, the wood and come out and it may take them six months, but they'll come out. So uh, you, you can make some major cuts. It's not good, but you know, if, you, if you've got a 60 foot tree and you wanna bring it down to eight feet, well, you gotta make some major cuts and it will come out as long as you whitewash it and protect it from sunburn. Um, it will come out and then you need to, to manage that wild regrowth that you're gonna get so that you can organize it so it doesn't get to be 60 feet again. Um, and that means going out on a regular, you know, every three, two to three to four months and then less and less over time, but, you know, nipping backs, um, clipping back, you know, guiding the regrowth. So yeah, you can take out some big wood, but you got to protect it from sunburn. Okay, um, is incorporating mulch into the soil better to combat Phytophthora so the enzymes will be more in the soil? No, mulch is meant to be applied at the surface. If you're gonna incorporate any organic matter, you need to have a compost. If you incorporate woody material into the soil, it's going to compete with the root system and you're going to lead to, it's going to lead to a nitrogen deficiency. And plus, when you start digging around, you're disturbing the root system. And that's not good. Um, you know, you cause wounding and, you know, in the case of 
citrus, when you start doing stuff like that, you, you can lead to, can lead to um, um, dry root rot and some other problems that we, along with phytophthora. So, you know, trees don't like their roots disturbed. You know, use a mulch, leave, don't mess around with the roots. You know, leave them alone, let them adapt to a mulch environment, you know, that you put down and then they'll, once it, they start developing their own leaf mulch, um, they'll be fine. Okay, and then I think this is the last one. Um, how many avocado trees that are stumped will die completely? You never want to stump prune a Phytophthora infested tree. You don't want to prune sick trees. You want to get them into a healthy situation and then you do the pruning. If you, you know, this is really common. I've got a, a sick tree, I'm going to cut it back and renovate it. And commonly what happens is it grows out for about a year or two and then boom, it collapses. And that's because all the new growth occurs at the expense of energy that goes into the root system that's defending it itself from infection. And so it, you drain all the carbohydrates, all the nutrients that are going to the root system, and it's going into this lush new growth and uh, the tree collapses. So it, it, you ask me what proportion, I've seen whole orchards die in two years after stumping, you know, and I've seen, you know, one, two, three, four, five trees in an, you know, in an acre go down after. In fact, we did this, we used to do walkabouts in San Luis Obispo because there were very few growers. So we'd get 15 or 20 growers and we'd go out to an orchard any orchard, and we'd, we'd go, what's the irrigation system like here? And what, what would we do here? And what's the problem here? And, and we came across this root rot tree and I said, let's prune it and we'll be back in a year and see what we've got. And we came back in a year and it was dead. <laughs> so you don't prune sick trees, you get them into condition or you remove them. You know, a lot of times sick trees are not worth fooling around with, you know, get rid of it and get a healthy tree. Okay, well, thank you, Ben, for presenting, and um, thank you, everybody, for attending and hanging on till the end here. Hope you all have a good rest of your day.